Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the latest of our French Entree webinars. My name is Zoe Smith. I'm digital editor of French Entree, and today's webinar is the second in our Moving to France series, in which we're going to cover everything you need to know about retiring to France. I'm joined today by a panel of three experts from our partners at Blevins Franks, Agence AXA Internationale, and Moneycore, and I'll be introducing you to them in just a moment. For those of you that aren't familiar with French Entree, we are part of the France Media Group, who are specialist publishers covering all aspects of French life and culture, from travel to gastronomy to buying property. French Entree itself has been a leading resource for French property buyers for 20 years now. In fact, 2023 is our 20th anniversary. And not only do we help buyers to find their dream property in France, we also help and advise with every aspect of the property buying and moving to France journey. Now, if you are looking to buy a property in France, you may also be interested in our French Property News magazine, which you can subscribe to over on the French Entree website. And whilst you're there, make sure that you also sign up for our free weekly newsletter. So without further ado, let's get started with today's Retiring to France webinar. Uh, we're aiming for a runtime of around 90 minutes today, and each of our speakers are going to give a short presentation, after which I will be putting some of your most frequently asked questions to them. So I'd now like to introduce our panel of experts. So if I could ask you all to please turn on your cameras now. There they are. So first up today will be Peter Wakelin from Blevins Franks, who's going to be covering pension options, taxes, French inheritance laws, and estate planning for retirees moving to France. Following Peter, we'll have Helen Harrop from Agence AXA Internationale, who will be focusing on healthcare in France for retirees, so looking at getting your carte vitale and mutual top-up insurances. And last but definitely not least, we have Toby Reynolds from Currency Exchange Specialist Moneycore, who will be talking you through the various currency exchange solutions for retirees, whether you're purchasing a property or transferring your pension into euros. So a big thank you to all of you for kindly giving up your time to join us this morning. Um, we're going to go straight over to our first speaker now, which is Peter Wakelin from Blevins Franks. Over to you, Peter. Thank you, Zoe, for the introduction. Um, as I say, Peter Wakelin, um, I'm a partner here at Blevins Franks based in New York and Bergerac. Um, I've been here living in France and providing advice since 2007. Um, what we're going to be talking about this morning is a brief overview of system, uh, particularly pensions and the tax system. Um, it is largely aimed, uh, I would say, at UK nationals. It will, however, be appropriate for certain other nationals, Australians, Canadians and things, so we will bring that commentary in where applicable. What I would say, the big exception generally is, however, if you have a US connection. Um, people with US connections tend to have, uh, always have the requirement for US requirements to file tax returns there, and it would be important for particular individuals like yourself in that situation to seek advice from somebody with US access to provide advice. So let's just start, start off with, with a base summary overview and census the system. French tax year is a calendar year um, split um, January to December. Um, when you arrive and become permanent resident, however, uh, tax assessment period is from your date of arrival. So you have a split tax year position. Um, unlike the UK uh, and many other countries, in France, as a couple who have a formalised relationship, you have a household tax return, unlike individual assessments previously. Um, in determining the actual tax and who has right to apply taxes on your assets and your income sources, these are determined by local French tax law and the combination with an appropriate double tax treaty. Um, the double tax treaty is quite important because it ensures you don't get taxed twice on the same sources of income. So let's start off with then, in terms of it, global sources of income, everything becomes declarable. However, not all of it is actually taxable. And we'll mention this a few things in a bit later. Global assets, though, also then form part of your global estate from an inheritance perspective. And we'll talk about that slightly later again in the, the, the presentation. Let's start with pensions then. And, and again, principally, there are three main sources of pensions that most people are generally have or familiar. UK state pension is the first one to talk about. Um, moving to France with a state pension basically means you continue to have the same benefits as if you were resident in the UK. Namely, it will continue to uplift itself. Uh, the key point, it comes declarable and taxable on a French tax return. 
So it does need to be taken outside of the UK tax system. What's also important about holding uh, and in receipt of a state pension is a significant benefit of being able to obtain something called an S1 form. That will provide you significant benefits as regards access to the health cover and also help mitigate certain liabilities with social charges, something to be really looked at. Um, irrespective of when your state pension starts, maybe at some point in the future, after arriving in France, you still have that benefit of obtaining an S1. Looking at uh, other pensions then, let's look at then, yeah, what used to be the, the bedrock of most people's background in retirement, occupational defined benefit schemes. Largely again, all become declarable in France. Importantly, however, there are certain occupational schemes that will always remain tax liable in the UK and other countries where applicable. These being what they call government deemed occupational schemes. So for the likes of civil servants, military, pensions, uh, teachers and the like, whilst you still have to declare it in France, they remain liable in, in the UK and therefore on the French tax return, you benefit a tax credit. Moving forward, then looking at other schemes, uh, and largely speaking, we're talking about defined contribution schemes, be these occupational or private arrangements. Again, all of these become declarable on a French tax return and need to be taken outside of the UK tax system in due course. Um, the key point with regards to occupational schemes or actually defined contribution schemes is an important factor about possibilities of pension cash lump sums because that is available as a UK resident tax-free. Unfortunately, that's lost as a tax-free benefit on moving to France. So it will be important to consider if you're looking at available to take cash lump sums from your pensions to do that before you move to France, because otherwise leaving it until after arriving, the lump sums become taxable on a French tax return and not ideal. Um, the other key with regards to defined contribution schemes, unfortunately, is a bit of a dilemma currently. And this is largely to do with Brexit, unfortunately, that word, um, and the negotiated trade deal that did not include a financial services agreement. What it basically means is as you move to France, nobody in the UK from a financial advisory perspective can then provide you any advice with respect to your defined contribution management of the funds. And therefore, it does provide something of a dilemma for people when they need to look at this as actively being managed after removing. So what are the options for people? Uh, well, simply there are three. Largely speaking, the first one is, uh, is you do nothing, but doing so, you have to then be prepared to accept the risk of being nothing and the risk of your funds not being actively managed going forward. Second one is a possibility to transfer it to a UK arrangement that does allow and facilitate advice to be provided as a non-UK resident limited and there are a few of them around but again that's an option to consider last but not least is a possibility to move the whole pension fund outside of the uk system to consider perhaps a an, an offshore arrangement such as a quarrels um that in itself then will obviously provide you ongoing advice um then there are alternative also additional benefits for potential quarrels such as the ability to create an income stream in euros, something that a UK scheme won't facilitate. So there's lots of things to consider there. And the important part is about taking an advice, particularly as the rules say, FCA UK rules, for example, mean that anybody that has a fund value of 30,000 has to be seen have formal advice to make any decisions or changes to your pensions arrangements. And that's the key with regards to pensions, simple in the sense. Now, I'm just going to briefly now touch on the French tax system and the main taxes that you will become liable to on your various sources of income and assets. Let's start with income tax. Income tax in France is uh, based on a banded, banded system base. Um, and importantly, there are more bans and tax bans in France compared to other countries. So an income tax perspective in isolation you might find it surprising that your tax liability is either no more, and more often than not, quite often lower than it would have been in the UK, for example. Um, the key with regards to the other things, pension income, investment returns, rental incomes, all become liable for declaration. The one that's the real one that's in control that you have is largely around investment returns. 
Um, for anybody that's regularly been making regular investments over the years, um, anything in the UK, for example, tax efficient ISAs and premium bonds, those have lost their tax efficiency on moving to France. So it's important to consider what to do with those, particularly by in cashing them to avoid tax liabilities and restructuring them into efficient tax wrappers that are available to provide you tax sheltering going forward on moving to France. Um, looking at another tax, and it is a tax, but it's called something else. It's called social charges, but for all intents and purposes, it's tax in another way. Um, this is why at different rates, depending upon the source of the nature of the income. The base rate, for example, at 17.2%, is applied on investment returns and rental receipts. Pension income is applied at a slightly lower rate at 9.1. And here's the nice part for those we were talking about an S1 benefit. Anybody that holds an S1 means that pension income is exempt from that, so, uh, that 9.1 liability. And from an investment return, it's reduced from 17.2 to a lower rate at 7.5. So an S1 provides really benefits with reducing and keeping your charges liability to a minimum. Capital gains tax, like most things, there is applicable in France. Um, there is no allowance available for capital gains tax positions. So from a perspective of selling equity, be it unit trusts or shares, as a French resident, any realised gain will become liable to a flat rate at 30%, or your marginal rate if that's more appropriate. The key, therefore, perhaps is to consider moving and reducing that liability by structuring them before you move to avoid that 30% liability and then investing in something that's sufficient for you going forward and providing exemption from future capital gains tax internally by doing so. Property, anybody owning secondary property, selling as a French resident, becomes liable for capital gains tax in France. The base rate for property capital gains tax is 19%. For any amounts that is again in excess of 50,000, there are additional surcharges on top, unfortunately. In addition, there is that social charge liability at 17.2, reducing to 7.5 if you hold an S1. And whilst there's no allowances, there is something called taper relief available in France, which effectively means the longer you've owned the property, the gain element that becomes declarable for the liability is reduced by a percentage each year over the ownership. So it can help provide a significant reduction over time. Um, for anybody that's a French resident that also then looks to sell a UK property as a secondary property, that particular property then becomes declarable for capital gains tax in both the UK, under UK rules, and in France. The key with regards to the UK, the best value for the calculation of the gain is as at April 2015, when they changed all the rules. Um, last but not least, in terms of brief overview of the tax system, is about wealth tax. And wealth tax is pretty sort of unknown to most parts of the world, apart from Sioux locations, France being one. Um, now, the French wealth tax now has undertaken numerous changes over the years. Current rules are it is only a calculable on physical property ownership. That includes main residents, secondary residents and all those things. When you first move to France, the only property that's included in the calculation is your French property, which does benefit a slight discount of 30% in the calculation. Um, Thereafterwards, other property worldwide forms part of the calculation beyond the fifth anniversary. You are allowed ownership of 1.3 million is the threshold. Anything below that value, no liability. Anything above 1.3 million, you then have a tax liability in banded rates. So it's an important thing to um, with regards to property ownership. Is it a good thing long term as a French resident? Something to consider in parts of, of review. Okay. Um, briefly now, just to look at inheritance and inheritance rules and tax liabilities. When you become French resident, your global estate becomes declarable as part of your estate for French tax rules and the tax liability. The key one about the rules, um, for anybody that's got children, um, that's the key one, because children under the French system are deemed to be protected heirs, which effectively means without doing any planning, they must ordinarily receive a minimum estate value ahead of a surviving spouse. 
ideally something not normally required as a wish for most people. So it's something to consider and there are you know, solutions to get round it, but it's about planning for it. From a taxation perspective, unlike the UK, for example, where it's the estate that pays the tax, under the French system, it's the named beneficiaries. So your heirs become liable to pay the tax. And that tax rate, in, and they're free of tax allowance, is dependent upon your relationship to your heir. For example, you can bequeath to a child €100,000 without tax liability. And I think thereafterwards, they get taxed in bad rates. So it's something to consider about to mitigate that. The worst case scenario, unfortunately, is non-blood relative. And that includes stepchildren, which again, unfortunately, can come across quite regularly. An individual parent bequeathing to a stepchild, their allowance is reduced to a really, really small allowance of about 1,600 euros, with them then having to pay tax on the amounts in excess at 60%. It's huge. So it's about looking at what your wishes are and looking at some of the solutions that are available to help, one, with the rules, but also, two, look to solutions to help mitigate the tax liability. There are a number of them, which might include, well, how have you purchased your property? Is it included with hunting clause? Um, there are structures about looking at operations of how your marriage is established in the regime that can. Again, a change in marriage regime can help. Um, there are then all sorts of other financial asset structures that can help mitigate it. Um, so it's about looking at solutions. The important point is no one solution normally fits. And it's about looking at the multiple options and combining them for your particular wishes. So in short, you know, there's lots of things we've just briefly gone through in brief. Um, the point being, I think it's about looking at taking advice and planning for it. And we would always look to recommend starting that process, probably at least a minimum of six months before you move, preferably 12 months, because that's the ideal starting point for looking at what you need to be considering, particularly as there are certain actions you ought to be doing before you make the move, hence the planning beforehand, and there afterwards, the planning to be undertaken and what you need to do on arrival. And the, the aim being, of course, all the way around is keeping your wishes to what you want to do, but at keeping your tax liability at the same time to a minimum. Both combinations there afterwards is about then looking at providing you in a nice, simple way, peace of mind going forward after moving and becoming French resident. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Peter. Um, lots of really good advice there for, um, for anyone who's starting out on that journey of retiring to France. Right, we're now going to put a few of your most frequently asked questions to Peter. And remember, we will have more time for questions at the moment. So we are keeping an eye on the Q&A box. Um, don't think that we've missed them. OK, first up, uh, is it still possible to use a QROPS since Brexit? And would you advise doing this? Well, as I saw, it's one of the options available with personal or defined contribution pension planning in reference to, one, provide additional flexibility, uh, but importantly, ongoing advice. So yes, a core ops is still available since Brexit. Um, it is about, is it right for everybody? No, so it's about undertaking an analysis, defining what your wishes are, and looking at that as an option, comparing other options like retaining in the UK SIP as well. So it is possible to look at as parts of future structuring for pension arrangement. I mean, probably one of the biggest elephants, you know, more recently announced and it was only really coming across even more so this week when Jeremy Hunt was at the Mansion House statement, and he was talking about what they may be doing with future UK pension changes, one of which was quite interesting about forcing pension funds to have to invest in a minimum investment in non-regulated stocks and shares. Highly risky, high risk area, and this may be something forced upon it. Moving the fund away from the UK by moving it to acquire ops would remove all those regulatory controls that the UK could impose on you in the future. So I think, you know, it's an option to consider, most definitely. Great. OK, thank you. Um, what are the tax consequences of taking out a lump sum payment for my pension? And should I do this before or after moving to France? And again, as briefly mentioned earlier, Ideally, taking a pension lump sum, i.e. the tax-free element we're talking about here specifically, should be arranged before you leave the UK. 
because it is only tax free whilst you're a UK resident. If that was deferred, whilst you can still do it on moving to France, the actual tax, the lump sum becomes declarable and is taxable at marginal tax rate. So depending upon the value of that lump sum, it could cause you to significant French tax liability to arrange that lump sum after moving to France. So clear message, try to look at doing it before you move. Okay, good advice. Um, what are the rules for gifting in France? And could this be a way to avoid French inheritance laws? Um, it is an option about French inheritance rules. I can help mitigate it. The keys with regards f as a French resident doing it is having to plan it really. First and foremost, there are an allowance you can gift. Um, and for example, a gift to a child, you can gift up to 100,000 without causing an immediate tax liability. Anything in excess of that will cause a liability. And while we talk about planning it early, however, is that gift, then you have to outlive that gift 15 years. And unfortunately, if you were to pass away before the 15th anniversary of making the gift, that value of gift comes into your estate for the calculation of inheritance tax. Hence the comment about having to really plan for such gifts very early in order to try and achieve what you're trying to do. Okay, that makes sense. Um, right, thank you, Peter. We will come back to Peter again with more questions at the end, so do keep them coming. Um, before we go over to our next speaker, I'm going to put the first of our polls up on the screen. Um, let me just find it. Here we go. Okay, you should be able to see that now. So the question is, when are you looking to retire to France? Nice, easy question to get you started. So as soon as possible, uh, in the next six months to one year, within the next five years, at some point in the future, uh, I'm already retired in France, perhaps some of you are already there, or I haven't decided if I want to retire to France. Maybe some of you are here just to scope out the options and see whether it's uh, the right choice for you. So I'll just give you a minute to uh, answer that. Looks like you're getting your answers in quickly. I think most of you have almost nearly answered. Obviously lots of people awake this morning. Okay. Right, I think most of you have answered. So I'm gonna end that in just a second. I won't do a countdown. Okay, here we go, let's have a look. So I'll share those results with you as well. Um, quite even, most of you, um, most of you saying within the next five years um, and others saying within the next six months to one year, few saying uh, as soon as possible or at some point in the future. And yeah, a fair few of you saying I haven't decided yet if you want to retire to France. So hopefully this webinar will help all of you out. Um, but certainly for those of you wanting to move within the next year or five years, this is the perfect time to start planning and thinking about all of the things that we're, we're going to be talking about in today's webinar. Okay, we'll stop sharing that for you. And um, let's go over to our, our next speaker, which is Helen Harrop from Agence AXA Internationale. Uh, over to you, Helen. Hi, thanks very much. I hope that everybody can hear me okay. Um, my name's Helen. I work for the Agence AXA International in France and my specialism is in healthcare. So hopefully I'm going to be able to take you through the some of the terminology you're going to need and some of the things you're going to need in order to get registered and how to access the system. So first, if I tell you a little bit about um, our agency, who we are and what we do, um, we are a dedicated English speaking agency and we're based in the southwest of France, but we are staffed with English speakers, the vast majority of us native English, and we all have experience in insurance and banking in the United Kingdom, Ireland, USA and beyond, to be honest. And we offer our specialist service for English speakers across the whole of France. And hopefully we can guide you through. So looking at insurance, if we look at what you need to do before you even arrive, because this is often quite a big concern for people, there's, there's a few different things we can cover. So looking at, um, I would say for UK citizens, but also anybody coming from other countries in the EU to France, you can look at the S1. And the S1 basically, and I know Peter re referred to this earlier, it's quite a powerful document. 
and you need to be of retirement age in the country that you were working in and you can apply for this document and it basically gives you exportable benefits and you will be able to come to France, register for a social security number immediately and access the system straight away and the costs will be back charged to the country. I mean, I know for lots of people it's going to be the UK, but it's the same for other EU countries too. Um, and very powerfully, you can use this as your health insurance when you're applying for the one year visa, if you need to do that. You don't need an additional insurance. The S1 is suitable for that purpose. Um, in order to support that, I would definitely recommend, although the S1 is powerful and it does give you cover and you can immediately register with that when you arrive in France, moving to a new country, is, it can be quite overwhelming. There's a lot to do, there's a lot to understand. So I would recommend that you have a temporary health insurance cover that will provide cover for you in case of accidents or emergencies. Nobody wants to think anything bad is gonna happen, but you know, just in case something happens, this can give you cover while the social security registration takes place and all the paperwork is done, just to give you a bit of peace of mind. But it doesn't necessarily have to be the same level of cover as you would need for a visa application. So then talking of visa applications, you do need um, health insurance to support that. And if you are coming from a country that doesn't have an S1 and you don't have access to that, or if you're early retired and you're not yet at um, retirement age in your country, you will need uh, an additional insurance to support that visa application. There's some quite specific uh, requirements it has, the minimum cover level, it must include repatriation. Um, the UK visa application centres are being very much more specific about what they require. So again, I would recommend you speak to somebody who has experience of these kind of policies and make sure that you get something that is suitable for your visa. If you're not looking at a permanent move, then you possibly need just a Schengen travel insurance policy because coming to France, you need to make sure that you're covered for the whole of the Schengen zone. Even the full visa insurance will cover you for the Schengen zone and that's part of the requirement. Um, because once you're in France, obviously you're gonna have freedom of movement and they need to, the, the, the authorities need to know that you're covered for all of those countries. If you're coming for shorter periods of time, you can get quite good and cost-effective Schengen insurances up to six months at a time. If we then move on and think about the French health system itself, so this is gonna be a bit further down the line when you're registered, what I'm gonna do with the next two slides is talk a little bit about some of the terminology you might have heard. And if you haven't heard it already, this is something that will come along and hopefully this will make it all just a little bit more familiar for you when you're actually doing your registration. One of the things I think a lot of people have heard of is Puma, and this is Protection Universal Malady. And this has been in place since 2016. And rather than being an actual um, procedure or a process or a place, what it is, it's the French that have put in law that it gives you the right to healthcare in France once you are considered to be legally resident. And in practice, what this means is that once you have lived in France for three months and that you can demonstrate that you are legally and stably resident with your visa, with your income, that you fulfill the requirements, then you are entitled to apply to join the French healthcare system. Now, for some, for most people, that's probably going to be a no brainer. It's a, it's a good system. You can get straight in there. However, for some people, it, it might be something you need to, to look at, discuss with your accountant, certainly discuss with your tax advisor, such as Blevin Franks, because when you are uh, in the French health system, you will also be required to make social security contributions in order for that care, unless you have, as we've said, the, the previously the S1 form, or you're already paying because you work there. So it's just something to be aware of and to think about. Um, Another one you will come across is CPAM, the Case Primaire Assurance Maladie, and that's the main health fund. This is the people who manage the contributions and they manage the payments that are made to you when you get your health care. Um, some of the other things, just to bear in mind, uh, this obviously people are coming from all sorts of different countries that have been in lots of different systems, but generally in France, 
Access to healthcare is not free at point of access. When you go to the doctor, you will normally have to pay. And then once you have your social security number and then eventually your carte vitale, you will receive reimbursements directly to your bank account. There are exceptions to this, and I think the whole French system is built on exceptions, if I'm honest. So there are some points where you will not be expected to pay visits to urgence or um, accident emergency, for example. One of the biggest differences people will see is that when you do have your social security number, the French social security system refunds a percentage of the cost that you pay. The social security system has a set fee for every procedure, and this is known as the Bastard de Fondorcement. And then they have um, this figure is associated with every treatment you can think of, from a visit to the doctor, to an x-ray on your ankle, to an x-ray on your little finger. Each one is different. And then you will receive a percentage of this fee. So simplest example is seeing the general doctor where the Bastard de Fondorcement is 25 euros, and you will receive 70% back. In practice, this means there's a €7.50 additional charge that you would be expected to pay out of pocket, or this is where people then have a mutual top-up policy. And obviously, looking at €7.50 to see the doctor, that is relatively trivial. It's not too big a deal. However, the reason you really should consider a mutual top-up policy is there are things which where doctors, specialists, um, areas will charge a great deal more than the bastard reimbursement on the social security set fee. And you're going to see when we come on to the mutual later how that actually works. Just to go through a few more of the items on the next slide, just a few other things for you to, to, to be aware of. You'll know, I'm sure, if you started to look at the French system, the carte vitale. This is your personalised card with the chip that the doctors and other practitioners can use to access directly your records and also process and generate your reimbursements. Um, you can get reimbursements before you receive this card. As soon as you receive a temporary social security number, you can access the French system. It just means you're going to have to request your reimbursements manually. But to be honest, I think for most people, the day you receive your actual carte vitale is a opening of champagne moment because it feels you're finally there. Um, you will come across again, amelie.fr. Now, Amelie is the overall website that manages, it's got all the information on reimbursements, where to go. Um, you, and here you can access your Amelie account, which takes you straight into your healthcare account where you can very powerful. You can manage your reimbursements, um, access your carte vitale, access all your information. Really, really powerful and definitely worth getting set up. Um, you, we have doctors here from Medicine Treton through to specialist consultants. A lot of this you can access through some of the systems. You can search, you can see them on your system. Prescriptions fall into different categories in France. There's, although we've got um, white, blue and orange label here on the slide, actually there's also the category of non-reimbursable medicines. And in my experience, just because you're issued with a prescription from a doctor or a consultant, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will be a reimbursable medicine. But I, I do also find pharmacists are very good at helping guide you through the different reimbursements. So a white medicine, for example, which is going to be things like antibiotics, painkillers, high clinically effective, high, highly clinically effective medicines, they will be reimbursed by the state at about 65%. Blue is medicines which have recognized clinical effectiveness, but not as high priority as the white. And they're reimbursed at around 35%. An orange label, which are things like cough mixtures, cough medicines, and they're around 10% from the state. So this is where a mutual can start to step in. Um, <clears throat> things to bear in mind, things like hospital visits, treatments and transport can all be treated in different ways. Um, some of the charges that you'll receive outside of the state reimbursement can be quite high, particularly with things like ambulances and with consultant fees. And just one, particularly for people who are retired, possibly to think about or to be aware of, is there is a status known as ALD, which is affection longue durée in France. And this is for long-term health conditions. And this covers um, diabetes, heart disease, 
multiple sclerosis, cancer, there's a really long established list. And if your, if your illness falls within one of these categories, you will receive enhanced reimbursements. But just bear in mind, the enhanced reimbursements that you'll receive are for that illness only. And if a doctor, whilst treating that illness, does charge above the best reimbursement, you would still be liable for that charge. A really good example of that would be um, somebody with diabetes who needs to see um, a dermatologist or a podologue, uh, podologist, they often charge higher than the set fee and you will need to pay those additional fees. So just to bear that in mind. So if we just step onto mutual top up insurance, it's something I think you need to think about and you need to be aware of when you're setting your budget, because it's quite common in France. I would say the vast majority of French people do have a mutual top up policy, but the cover can vary enormously. So in effect, this is to cover the difference between the physical cost that you pay for your treatment and the refund that you receive from CPA. And in some cases, this might be trivial, 750 for seeing a doctor. And in other cases, this can be 600 euros for an ambulance, which has been my own personal experience. Um, your mutual will be automatically linked to your account with CPAM um, in many cases. And um, that means that the reimbursements will be generated automatically for you and everything will happen behind the scenes. Mutual will also help to cover the cost of a private room in hospital, which is quite common in France. Um, that is not covered by the state. Also complementary treatments such as osteopath, chiropractor, etc. The Again, these are things that are not covered by the state. Um, Counselors, psychologue, also not covered by the state. So Mutual can give you good cover for these. One of the important areas is that they provide enhanced cover for private clinics and specialists. If you choose to see people who are very experienced and highly regarded in their scene, you can find they'll charge 200% double the set fee, or if in some cases, a great deal more. One particular clinic, American Hospital in Paris, will charge many times the Basta reimbursement for their doctors. One little thing which is often not considered with a mutual is they can help and step in with some additional services if you have to be hospitalized, such as helping organize get you to hospital and get you home. They can organize home help when you are home for shopping, a um, bit of housework, gardening, if you're, you need help and assistance with that. Somebody to look after your pets and obviously for people who are studying, a bit of study support, but probably not as relevant for, for you here today. The mutual is, is, it is a minefield and it can be a minefield. And I would always recommend that you speak to somebody who is a specialist, who understands this well, who can go step by step with you through your personal situation and look at exactly what you need and with your budget and your situation and find a good solution. Because we can go all the way from a policy which will only cover you for an inpatient hospital stay, like the Hospi Tradi here, right up to 400% policies, which will give you really kind of high level cover for, you know, things across the board. We can look at, excuse me, options for enhancing cover just when you're in hospital, for optical dental and for complementary treatment. Just a quick word on optical dental, because the real cost of most optical dental treatment in France is way, way above the set cost. So if optical and dental treatment is important to you, then that is really something to focus on when you're looking at a mutual. Just to finish off, obviously health insurance is part of the whole package. Before you arrive in France, it's worth thinking about having things set up. So somebody, we can help you look at exactly what you need to think about to have a bank account set up so you can get here. Property insurance, which is quite different in France to other countries. So just so you're aware of the differences and what you need to think about. And with vehicle insurance, often to just think about what documents you need to have ready before you arrive in France. These are just things to have at the back of your mind once you're starting on this journey. Um, and obviously we can help advise with that. Thanks for your time. I hope it hasn't been too confusing. I know there's a lot of terminology with health insurance, but I hope some of this today has just helped you to 
get some of this fixed in your mind so that when you start on the journey, it makes a little bit more sense. Great. Thank you so much, Helen. I think that's going to be really useful for anyone looking to retire to France. And you're right, the healthcare system can be quite confusing when you first get here. Um, right, I'm going to put a few of your most frequently asked questions to Helen. And remember, we will be answering a lot of your live questions at the end as well. Um, so first of all, um, let me just get my questions up. Are retirees with existing medical conditions able to get mutual top-up insurance in France? Short answer is yes. Um, there are some exceptions with very high level mutual policies, but for the vast majority of mutuals, then there is actually a legal requirement that pre-existing conditions are not considered. So it will make no difference to the cover you receive or the price of the product. The downside of that is that the cost of health insurance, the mutual top up insurance does increase with age because the risk profile is done across the board and generally rather than individually. So I think a retired couple in their early 60s need to budget for at least, I would say, around 70 to 80 euros per person for a good solid mutual. Although, again, as I've said, you can get much cheaper options and much more expensive options. OK, great. Well, I think that'll be reassuring, at least for, to people to know that they can get coverage, at least. Exactly. Um, OK, um, I've had quite a lot of questions coming about S1s, which will address some of them at the end. But let's start with this one. Um, can I still get an S1 form since Brexit? And does this mean that I don't need private health insurance when moving to France? Yeah, I think I did touch on this. And yes, you can. But obviously, the availability of the S1 has changed somewhat. So there are some things that you used to be able to apply for an S1 form for that you now cannot. However, you, if you are of UK retirement age, you're receiving the UK government pension, then you are entitled to an S1 form. Um, you don't need the insurance in order to apply for your visa. However, I would recommend that, as I said, that you have something in place because it can take some time for that S1 form to be processed and registered before you have a social security number. And in my experience, although if something does happen, they will do their best to expedite your social security registration. The last thing you want to think about is having to chase that paperwork if you've been admitted to hospital as an emergency. Yeah, that's very good advice. Um, OK, one more. Is there a way to search for English speaking doctors and specialists in France? It, yes and no. Um, I think th the reality is there's, you know, you're in France, so it's worth having some kind of basic knowledge of um, of terminology. That said, most doctors are highly educated and do have some English. I've come across some that don't, but I would say the vast majority have some English. You can specifically look at our websites, such as Dr. Lib, and there's a few others. Um, I can't remember them off the top of my head, but I know I've used them. I mean, Dr. Lib, I think, is one of the most famous. And there you can search for doctors for particular specialisms in your area. And they normally have um, a file there which tells you their qualifications and the languages that they speak. So you can look at that. Brilliant. OK, um, great. We'll stop there with the questions now for, for Helen, but we will come back to you at the end. Um, and remember, if you do still have a question for Helen or any of our panellists, you can drop it in the Q&A box at any time throughout. Um, right. We're going to go over to our third speaker now. I can see he's already raring to go. Um, yep. <laughs> so this is over to Toby Reynolds from Currency Exchange Specialist Money Corp. Over to you, Tony. Thank you, Zoe. Um, firstly, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Toby, an account manager at Money Corp, and I support private clients such as yourselves on the call today um, with nav navigating the complicated market of currency exchange. Um, now, this is going to be a very fast whistle stop tour, but I'm sure that today's topic will be relevant for all of you um, as we discuss what impact foreign exchange can have on your move when you when you're looking to move to France and, and notably on your French property purchases, your pensions and your movement of savings. Um, we're going to be looking at what to look out for, uh, what you can do to manage your foreign exchange exposure and hopefully make something that sounds quite complicated and you're not used to very simple. Um, so what's going to look on the agenda now? understand that some of you may not be familiar with our services so i wish to start with 
hopefully putting things into perspective um, before we go on to discuss the, the fundamentals of FX and um, what to be looking for before you move. We'll also have a look, a brief look back at the GBP Euro uh, exchange rate during 2022, uh, see why it fluctuated, how it fluctuated, and finally discuss a case study that hopefully will be relevant to yourselves to, so you can see the process, how things work, um, and how a typical property purchase in France uh, will be looking for you when, you when you eventually start to move before we obviously recap and any questions at the end. So, who is Money Corp? Firstly, um, we've been in the industry for 40 years. Uh, we're one of the longest established foreign exchange providers and essentially we're a non-banking provider of foreign exchange. Uh, our headquarters are in the UK, um, that's where I'm based. Uh, however, you can, as you can see from the map, we've got various international um, footprint and offices that have local bank accounts um, to support all, support all our clients across uh, across the globe. For the purpose of today, I'm going to focus solely on um, UK residents with who are holding pounds and moving those to euros, obviously to France. Uh, however, ensure that if there's anyone on the call that isn't in the UK um, and situated globally with other currencies, we can support the majority of the globe, um, over 120 currencies um, and 190 countries so i'm sure we will be able to help um we're fully regulated in all areas we operate and our clients are uh funds are safeguarded segregated from our business and therefore guarantee security uh, when it comes to transacting your funds 80 percent of what we do is particularly uh for private clients is uh property related either directly or indirectly as well as of course pensions um, and movement of uh, of your of your savings essentially um, to your european bank account so before i start i want to ask the question of course you're not going to be able to answer me but i'll just have a little think of would you buy a property in your home country if you didn't know how much you're going to pay for it I'm assuming the answer is going to be no, um, as obviously everyone wants to have some security over how much they're going to buy a property. They want to know how much they're paying for that before they go ahead and say, yes, we'll, we'll have it. Um, however, when you are looking to purchase a property abroad, um, you need to be understanding that it's not as straightforward as this is the price, this is what I'm going to pay. Now, why is this? So if we have a quick look at back at the 2022 20, GBP Euro exchange rate, I'm oh, sorry. Um, as you can see, there's quite a lot of variance between um, 2022 from the beginning of January all the way to December. Uh, notably in February where we saw the peak at 121, that means for every pound you receive one euro 21 compared to the lowest rate at 1.08. I believe in September, um, following the political um, sort of uh, issues that we found with the political government, with Liz Trust um, and other various things. Um, now, if we were looking at 250,000 euros in in exchange from pounds, that's the equivalent of a difference of 25,000 pounds. So I could, I'm sure you'd agree over quite a short period of time, we've seen quite a lot of variance and it could be considerable differences um, for your for your funds, essentially. If that was a property purchase, that could be you're paying a lot more uh, for your property in September than you are in February. And if it's your movement of all of your assets into euros, it would mean you'd be receiving less euros in September than you would in February. Now, why is this important? As you can see from uh, the timeline here, there's roughly a three month period between when you first find your property and you say, yes, we'd like it. We want to put down a reservation fee deposit to when you actually get the keys. So during that period, um, you can see a lot of volatility and a lot of change in the price that you've actually agreed. So what we suggest is the earlier you're, you get into contact with 
a currency broker such as Money Corp, um, the better and start planning ahead and so you understand how the currency market's moving, um, what to look out for, um, what the price is at the, t at the time of putting down the reservation fee and sort of understanding your budget so you know how much you can afford um, to play with essentially in your funds to make sure that that price doesn't move out of your budget in three months time when it comes to paying uh, the completion funds. So what can you do? Um, I mean, with a, with a company like Money Corp, our day in day out is foreign exchange. We have the tools available to you um, to really manage your uh, finances, manage your payments, make sure that you're getting the best deal that you possibly can. Uh, and essentially we're a cost saving to the bank. So as I said, plan in advance. We'll very happily have a consultation with you free of charge. Um, explain your requirements, the timeline you're working with, um, the funds that you're working with, your budget, etc. And we'll help you to map out a plan that's suitable for you to make sure that you're receiving the right amount of euros that you need to pay for that property in three months time or, or whenever it is, a couple of months down the, time, down the line. Um, due to our expertise in the market and our uh, longevity, we have built a panel of 18 banking providers that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis that are providing us with the best uh, competitive exchange rates for our clients, hopefully yourselves, um, to really be able to get you the most euros that you possibly can out of your funds. Again, um, we also have the tools available, which I'll discuss very briefly, but if there are any further questions on these, I'll, ha I'll happily answer them uh, afterwards or later by email, however you want to uh, ask the questions. But firstly, um, what I would like you to be understanding is the four contracts. This is what we typically see with property purchases and our clients that are really beneficial during these periods. And I'll go for a case study later as well to explain it in full. But this essentially means that you can buy the currency now, but pay for it later at a later date so for those that are wanting some security around your property purchases ensure that you're paying the agreed price of whatever it was three hundred thousand euros to ensure that you know how much that's going to cost you in pounds you can agree a rate of exchange prior to your completion date up to two years in advance to ensure that the price that you're paying is the price that you've agreed we also have market orders. So if this means if you've got some time in your hands, um, you have a bit of a budget to play with and you want to see if the market could improve for you in that period, we also have market orders. This means that you can speak with your currency specialist um, and say, look, the current rates are, I believe we're at 117 today. I'm hoping for uh, before my completion at sem in September, the rate's going to improve to 118, 119. I'd like to set the market order at 119. So as soon as that rate is, uh, is hit, regardless of whether it's two o'clock in the morning uh, and you're not monitoring, monitor, monitoring it, um, those funds will be automatically bought for you. So you have those locked in at a preferred rate um, essentially saving you saving you money. We also have regular payment plans. So this is very similar to direct debits. Those that are not moving permanently or, or are planning to buy a property um, and want to pay off the mortgage every month but still live in the UK or the US or wherever it is, you can drip feed funds every month at a agreed price um, for those mortgage payments or those rental fees or even vice versa. If you're buying a property as a holiday home, you rent it out during the summer, um, those rental fees that you're receiving, you can drip feed them back into your UK bank account as well. Um, you also have online platform, so very similar to online banking. For those that use online banking, uh, we can facilitate payments for you online. You don't have to speak to someone on the phone. You can set up those yourself. You can set up beneficiaries, paying solicitor fees, paying to third parties. It's all something you'd be able to do um, on, on our online app. Um, essentially, we, we, don't, we don't advise. We provide guidance. Um, we, so when it becomes to speaking with us directly, everyone is allocated a market specialist. Um, that's your direct contact. Um, they'll be able to speak to you on the phone, whatever you need. If you just want an update on the, on the rates, what we think is going to happen. Um, 
if there's, for example, interest rates at the moment, obviously increasing monthly, um, and that typically in the short term will increase the value of the pound, or if it's euros, the value of the euro. Um, and we can give you that guidance and explain this is where it's moving um, and give you an informed, uh, help you to make an informed decision on when to, when's the best time to exchange your funds. The only thing we would advise is not to use your bank because of the cost implication that that um, you receive when you use your bank. Obviously, security is brilliant. Everyone's used to using the bank for payments. But when it comes to foreign exchange, I'd really advise to use a foreign exchange uh, specialist because you firstly won't be charged any transactional fees that you will when you use your bank. Um, you'll also be, have access to the cost effective rates of exchange as well that uh, typically a two percent saving on what the bank will provide you and of, of course also the, the tools i've explained to really help for those property purchases that are essential for sort of holding that uh, removing that risk out of the property purchase so if we go for a very quick uh, case study for you so I put everything into perspective um so as you can see on the right, we have the exchange rate between April 2022 and October 2022. Um, and Richard and his wife found their dream home um, property where they needed to pay for the property at 300,000 euros. So this was in June 2022. Um, they were introduced to Money Corp and to, un to undertake a currency consultation, uh, understand their uh, tools that had available to them and really start getting the ball rolling for making those payments and understanding what payments they're going to need to make during the journey um, and getting their assets ready for that for that purchase. In July um, 2022, they opened their Money Corp account and they had to pay the deposit, so 10% deposit of three, uh, 30,000 euros and they had to do that at the time that they requested on that day. So they used a spot contract. So that essentially is um, when you buy currency now and you pay for the currency now for execution today so they bought the currency at 117 um, and they discussed their options with their currency dealer uh, and they decided they wanted to use the use of a uh, market or market order at 119 so they set a rate of 119 um, for them to hope for that to be achieved within the next year. So from July, they didn't know where the exchange rate was going to move. They saw it was going to start increasing. Um, so they set a rate of 119 to execute their funds. July 28th, 28th 2022, that was reached, 119. We did actually further go to 119.5. Um, so they didn't hit quite the peak of the market, but they did a very good job at uh, managing their expectations and um, getting the most out of their funds. So at that point, they exchanged the two, the additional 270,000 ready for their purchase in September at a rate of 119. Over the course of the next two to three months, we saw a lot of volatility in the market. Again, I believe this was around uh, when Liz Trust was in um, Parliament for 48 days. Uh, also, the, the announcement of the mini budget as well. Um, and as soon as there's any volatility or any concerns um, at, in a country, typically um, the currency tends to, to struggle in those circumstances. So that's what we can see uh, on the graph during that period. Now, when it comes to their completion date on the 28th of September, uh, the actual exchange rate fell to a rate of 112. Now this is obviously very, very um, different to what they initially had when they first looked at the property back in June um, and when they actually bought the currency at 119. So on their completion date, um, it was at 112. Now, as you can see from the considerations that we have down below, that, that is a typical variance of 15,000 pounds from when they actually bought the currency to when the completion date was. So if they've left um, to pay for that property on the day of completion, they would have been paying £15,000 more than they would have expected um, at the day that they, they said, yes, we'd like the property, um, which I'm, I'm sure you would agree is a, quite a large, um, considerable exchange um, and difference. And for those that are 
buying properties more than that, that variance will increase. So you need to be making sure that you are aware of um, the exchange rates prior to, um, prior to putting a property, um, prior to agreeing on a property, uh, even before you go out on your expect it, um, inspection trips and even before you're looking at the budget that you're um, hopefully buying a property for so you need to be making sure that you're very much planning in advance so top tips i think we're just going to finish on a couple top tips um so yes foreign exchange as you can see from the exchange rate that we've uh, looked through from 2022 um it is a world of regrets because of the volatility and the uncertainty in the market um, because the rates are constantly moving we need to make sure that we're planning ahead so what do we suggest get familiar with the rate and currency tools available even before you find your property uh, this will help you to define your budget and feel more confident confident when you start to view your properties you can get free guidance at this stage this is when we suggest to get in contact with a currency specialist at the time of when you start to view properties Make a note of the exchange rate when you make an offer. This will give you a benchmark to help you make decisions later on and will help you define a range of a low and a high, which will, will serve you as a reference and help you decide when a rate is good for you. At the time of making the payment for the deposit, have another look at the rate. At this point, you are looking to remove the risk and make sure you buy without a budget. Now, this is typically when we see a lot of people using um, a forward contract. So if they like the rate, um, when they pay the deposit and they want some security, they'll ask to um, use a full contract that is only needing a 10% deposit. So you do not need the whole completion funds available at that point. You can accumulate them over that period of between your completion date, um, agreed completion date, and when you actually book in the full contract. If the rate is still within your budget, you might decide to pay the deposit at the rate and fix the rate. So that's again, yep, the full contract as discussed. Um, and again, if the rate is improved, you can decide to fix the whole price uh, before then. And then going back to the, the example that we used of market orders, you can agree um, to fix a rate before a rate is reached um, in the hope that it was going to move in that direction. And finally, there's no right or wrong answer. The market's constantly moving. As soon as you book that exchange rate in that's right for you, it's right for you. Um, and if it moves then a neg negatively, then you've beat the market. If it moves out of budget um, higher, then of course there is an opportunity that you could have um, purchased at sort of more beneficial rate for yourself but again it's all hindsight in the end of the day and if it's works for you then it's it's a it's a winner um that's everything we covered today uh i'd just like to make sure that you're aware that fx is of course um a subject that you may not typically uh think of when you, you you're based in one co country but when it comes to moving it is essential for your move so please do make sure you're planning in advance um, but again you have people there that can help you through the journey make it easy for you um, and explain how th how to do things so don't don't worry and enjoy the journey thank you very much brilliant thank you toby um right we'll jump into a few questions for toby um let's have a look um right what is the benefit of using MoneyCore over an online currency converter? Okay. Um, so firstly, currency converters online are brilliant. Um, they're very smooth platforms you can use. So you can uh, Google currency converter. You can plug in a rate, how much you want to exchange into euros. They'll provide you a rate and you can exchange them, send you where you need to go, which is um, normally at a very competitive rate, similar to, um, yeah very competitive for you however um, you won't be able to speak to someone on the phone um, and make sure that the funds are going where they need to be you won't be able to receive the guidance on the market where we expect it to move to uh, and you won't be able to use any of the tools that we spoke about as well that are really beneficial for property buyers um, when it comes to removing risk so it's essentially up to your own devices to decide i'm going to buy a currency now and then send it where it needs to go um, but having said that, they are very competitive. Um, but again, we'll happily have that conversation. If you've received a rate from elsewhere, we'll be able to, I'm sure, match it or even better it as well. Great. Okay. 
Um, right, my wife and I have just had our offer accepted and are due to complete in September. Uh, watch the markets as we're on a very tight budget. I do not have the funds available to lock in a rate at the moment, and I'm worried that the rate might fall out of favor. So what would you advise on this? Okay, so yes, if you're on a tight budget, a full contract is essentially probably the best option for you. Understand that you said you don't have the funds available, the full completion funds available to you. Um, that isn't essentially a com an issue. Um, we do often accept a 10% deposit. Um, so that's not a, a fee. That's essentially to lock in that rate for you. And we essentially uh, fill the rest for the time being, if that, <clears throat> if that makes sense. So um, if you do have 10% available, we can lock in a rate for you up to two years in advance. Um, so that is an option, but happy, happy to have uh, the conversation to um, discuss further your requirement and, and your timeline, et cetera, and see if there's anything else that we can do to help. Brilliant. Um, and finally, uh, how much do currency transfers cost? Okay, so essentially, if you were to use the bank, um, compared to a currency exchange uh, provider like Money Corp, you'll be saving around 2% on what the bank would offer you. Um, so the, the bank is obviously a transactional business. Um, their day-to-day -day isn't foreign exchange. They can obviously do it. They can facilitate ex for, for an exchange. However, when you make a payment from your UK bank account, for example, to a European bank account or a solicitor in Europe, in France, then that will be automated and you won't have any say on what the exchange rate is. So um, typically that won't be very favorable, favorable for you and you end up paying a lot more um, that you need to. Um, again, you have to pay transactional fees as well. These are only small. I mean, it could be 15 pounds, 20 pounds, but if you're making recurring payments every month, um, they can add up and uh, it's a payment that you don't need to be, you don't need to be a, a fee that you don't need to be um, occurring. So uh, essentially, I'd say around a 2% saving um, when it's on a larger transaction, that could be quite a considerable amount up to tens of thousands. So, Yeah, definitely. Okay, great. Um, right, we're going to leave it there with Toby for the moment. I'm just going to do a, another quick poll. I'm going to put that on our screen and then we're going to go into questions uh, for the whole panel. So this question is, what are your biggest worries about retiring to France? And you can answer as many of these as you want if you have multiple worries. Um, so getting a French visa or carte de séjour, uh, receiving my pension overseas, French inheritance laws and estate planning. Everybody's putting that one immediately. <laughs> um, that's always a worry for everyone. Health insurance or healthcare, learning French or language difficulties or just generally integrating into French life or managing my finances between different countries. So I'll just give you another 20 seconds to, to answer that. And on that subject, we're not covering visas and carte de séjour today, obviously, but we do have two webinars that we've previously done, which are up on our YouTube channel. So if that is a concern for you, looks like it is for quite a few of you, then do go over and check those out. Um, lots of frequently asked questions that we tackled in those. Okay, right, I'll just give you another 10 seconds to answer that, and then I'll share the results with you. And then we're going to go over to questions for the whole panel, and we'll be looking at some of the live questions that you've that have been coming in. Okay, right, I'm going to go ahead and end that poll and share that with you. Okay, so pretty split across everything. Most people are really concerned about French inheritance laws, which makes a lot of sense. Healthcare as well is quite high. Managing finances, so it looks like we've got a pretty good panel uh, today of experts for you. And, um, and yeah, learning French also a bit of a concern getting that visa. Okay, great. Thank you to everyone for taking part in that. I'll just take that off the screen. Right, let's just double check that I've got everybody still with me. Um, Peter, are you still there? Maybe. Helen? I am. Um, if you can hear me, okay. Helen, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. Uh, Toby, I should still have you. Yeah. I'll just double check. Peter, we still got you? Yeah. 
can't hear you, but I think he's going to Oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay, great. Right. We're going to jump into some questions. I'll try and get through yeah. <laughs> to as many of these as possible. So first of all, um, I think most of the attendees today are from the UK. Um, but we do have, we have had a couple of questions just from an American and an Australian. So I just want to put this to all of our panelists. Um, can you just clarify whether or not you offer your services for other nationalities other than uh, British clients? And we'll go to, say, let's say, Peter first. Sorry. The, the other question is uh, not for Americans, unfortunately because of rules and regulations restrict that but okay. the clients who are australian and and so, so yes is the answer to that one but native for american citizens unfortunately okay yeah it's true american citizens is a very specific particularly with tax laws and for anyone that is asking about that we have an american webinar in the works um coming very soon and we also have one that we did previously which should be on our youtube channel so we have a tax specialist there um that does deal with americans so that's one to check out um helen what about over at um, agence excellent international yeah obviously we deal with all nationalities really our only limitation is that you would rather work in english than in french and um, we regularly deal with people from all over the world to be honest brilliant great yeah and i'm sure most english people <laughs> prefer the working language to be english <laughs> even if we're good at french it, it does make things easier and it um, does. Be, i'm assuming being as you deal with international currencies americans australians and all other um, nationalities are welcome yes indeed brilliant okay well thanks for clarifying that right let's jump into a question for um for peter Right, I have a couple of people, uh, Robert had a question and Nigel had a question which are quite similar. So it's basically at what point do you become liable for tax in France? Um, so when you're moving, at what point do you need to stop paying your taxes in France and file that first tax return? In France and file that first tax return. From a perspective of becoming permanent president for France, it's liable from your date of arrival. Um, in terms of when you then start having your liability for income or assets is your date of arrival. And the tax issue in itself is, as we mentioned earlier, calendar year. So, for example, if we do say, I'm live today, the 13th of July, your liability for French tax then starts 13th of July to the end of December, and the first tax returns are done in May of the following year, covering that period. And then nearly their ends. Okay, great. That makes sense. Um, right, Helen, I've had quite a lot of questions about S1s. Um, mm -hmm. First one being, um, can, so Karen put this one in, and I think there was somebody else as well. I've lost the question now. Um, but basically, can they use a husband or wife's S1 and sort of piggyback off the back of that when they move from the UK to France? The short answer being yes. And I see this regularly. What it means in practice is that you have a shared um, CPAM account. You both receive care from the same social security number until you receive an S1 in your own right. But the short answer is yes. OK, great. And um, another one, whilst we're on the subject of S1s, another one from Peter is saying, if you have an S1, do you still need top up insurance? And then I, I'll add on one from Bill, which says, does an S1 cover 100% of the health costs or just 80%? I think these are related. Yeah, and it's a common question I get at work as well, just generally day to day. The, the S1 allows you to register in the French system, but you receive your health care the same as any French person. So Yes, you will only receive a percentage of the Bastard reimbursement. And again, although we talk about the 100%, you can often be charged a lot more than 100% for your health care. If you have an S1, you're no different to any other French person. And yes, you will still need a mutual. Okay, brilliant. And one more whilst we're, I'll get all these <laughs> ones out of the way. Um, one more from Mel. And if, I think a few other people have said similar things. If we become French residents and get into the French healthcare system, I'm assuming she means in S1, can we still use NHS services or do we lose them? Is that something you can... it, It's complicated, to be honest, and it's not 100% clear. So if you have an S1, then you 
you're still in touch. There's, there's a couple of different aspects to it, really, which is you can still have um, an EHIC card, which I know now in the UK is known as a GHIC card, but it, it's the same thing. But you would need to apply for that in the UK from the the, the same department that issues your S1. So you will have an EHIC card and you'll be able to use that throughout Europe. Now, post Brexit, the rules are a little bit more murky with an S1 about going back to the UK for healthcare. <laughs> The rules and the, the actual practice are going to be a little bit different, though, because I think you, technically I think you probably should use your S1, uh, your EHIC card when you go back to the UK and, and apply for um, only emergency health care. But I think the reality is the way the system is administered in the UK, it's going to be a little bit more um, murky about whether they're even going to ask you and how that's going to be managed. That that's just like the the pragmatism of, of real life versus like the actual the rules if you then leave france and go back to live in the uk you will have to reapply for the system again and you're entitled but you'll have to go through the paperwork okay that's really good advice and yeah it's absolutely true. I think the, the reality versus the rules is sometimes a little yeah. bit a little bit unclear yeah um, right okay great thank you helen um right toby let me find a question yep. for you Right, Sarah is asking, what is the minimum amount of money that can be transferred from the UK on a monthly basis? So what's the minimum amount? Is there a minimum amount? So we essentially don't, there's there's not a minimum, a minimum, a minimum amount, uh, essentially. We, we can service at any um, size funds uh, for anything from £10 up to £10 million. So there's no restrictions on how much you can send, but... Um, I'd suggest that it's probably best beneficial for yourself if you know that you have liabilities over, let's say, a six month, five, uh, six month, twelve month period, um, and you have the funds available. I'd suggest maybe doing it in a lump sum, or even um, discussing how much you have to do over that period, so we can sort of formulate a plan for you that's going to be beneficial for you and um, save you the, the most money that we can. Okay, brilliant. Um, right, Andy's saying. It's a bit of an odd question. Okay, if you purchase euros in advance of buying a property, should you also add things like notaries and agency fees to the euros that you're purchasing? I think what he's trying to say is, do you need to think of everything that you, um, all of the possible expenses, and make one transfer? Or you you don't have you don't have to um, on the smaller fees uh, that you have to pay, like notary fees or or solicitor fees etc i'd say that it, you won't see much difference if the market was to move there's not going to be a huge amount of difference um, on the larger sums there will be a significant difference and that's when you really want to be hedging your hedging your risk um, but if you do want to purchase a lump sum of euros in advance that you know you have to pay some fees with as well in in uh, addition to the property purchase then by all means uh, but if you wanted to you can hold pounds on account or euros in account and you can hold them separately as well so um, as and when you need to make those payments you can do and we can exchange them on the spot for you or we can buy them in advance for you okay that makes a lot of sense Great, right, let's go back to Peter. Um, Bill had a question saying, when you move your pension to a QROPS, do you have to pay any UK tax when you move it? So I guess at the point that you shift it to a QROPS. No, no is the answer at this point. <laughs> um, and I say that purely and simply because if you were actually looking at moving, for example, uh, a UK pension fund to outside the European Union area, to Australia, for example, the UK would impose currently an exit tax at 25%. That is not applicable currently for any transfers of UK pension arrangements to European-based sued crops. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I've had a few questions as well about uh, SIPs, so self-invested personal pensions. Um, Ian's saying, if I become a French tax resident, can I keep my UK SIP and what are the drawbacks? Oh, there's nothing stopping anybody from keeping a UK-based SIP. Where the issue becomes is what we are talking earlier on, in this, at this point in time, will lose any advice from a UK-based advisor with them moving to France 
So it is a risk, therefore, beyond there of not being able to get any formal advice on their pension funds after moving. But in the short term, nothing's stopping them from leaving it there. That's a choice for them. OK, that makes sense. Um, right. And another one um, from Bill. He's saying, is money held in a QROPS included in the wealth tax calculation? No, is the answer. As we talked about, only from a wealth tax perspective, it is currently, and it used to be, but currently since Macron um, became president, changed all the rules, particularly tax only property asset, nothing in the calculation. Are you cut out just on that last line now? Are you to be able to repeat that? that last line? Yeah, uh, just to repeat then, yeah. For wealth tax, the only assets that are included for the calculation for wealth tax is property assets. So money in the bank accounts, money in pension funds do not form part of the calculation for wealth tax. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for clarifying that. Right, let's go to Helen again. Um, I have a few more sort of specific questions about the health service, which I think will be quite interesting to people. So Sue's saying, I live in Australia where if you receive a prescription for a named medicine, you can also ask for a generic substitution, which are typically less expensive um, at the pharmacy. Is this the case in France? To, yes. And actually what I find is the rule is that they should issue a generic substitution unless it's specifically requested otherwise by your doctor. Um, in actual fact, to, to receive the specific medicine rather than the generic, it has to be noted on your prescription. Okay, I didn't know that. That's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's still down to, again, in, in practice, it's still down to pharmacists. Yeah, yeah so it's worth checking regardless, yeah. but that's good to know. But okay. you can definitely ask. Yeah. Yeah, and I know you mentioned before, pharmacists in France are really knowledgeable and often really very good, helpful, yeah. so it's definitely worth bringing things up with them. Um, right, Neil says, are eyeglasses free with your carte vital, or are they only free with a top-up mutual? Yeah, they're not. The glasses are not paid for by the French state at all. It's quite complicated, to be honest, this, and so, I mean, it's, it's difficult to answer in a very quick question, but the glasses are paid for by the mutual. And there are different types of mutual which pay for either basic glasses or like much um, higher mutuals which pay for better glasses or glasses with more options and such like. But you, it is still linked to the carte vitale, but it's a nominal link. So the, the, the French government pay around 10 cents towards the glasses just as a link Very to generous. control how many pairs I know. It, it's more of a, an administrative exercise for the amount of glasses, pairs of glasses you can have in a time period, basically. So no, the French government do not pay for glasses. Okay, that's good to know. I, I will just say though, to finish it off though, that um, since I, I've lived in France for 10 years and I've certainly noticed a change. So I'm lucky enough to live near a big city and I've noticed there are now shops such as Lunette Portus and Point Vision where you can get um, really affordable glasses just over the counter a lot more like you can in say the UK for example yeah and I've definitely my experience has been really good with opticians where you can often yeah oh, well I'd say good advice is to go in um talk to somebody straight away give them your mutual details and then they can also tell you which exactly exactly what you're going to be covered for yeah exactly, exactly. it's a good start yeah, before yeah. you start looking at something that you know isn't covered or is covered less um okay great thank you Helen right uh, Toby, uh, yep. have, okay, nice direct question here from Ian. How do Money Core get paid? <laughs> okay, <laughs> fair <laughs> enough. Um, so essentially, like I said, we, we we work with eighteen banking providers. These are your household names um, like Santander, um, Deutsche Bank, J.P. Morgan, etc. And they're all essentially offering us a rate of exchange that's close to what is called interbank levels so this is what you'd see if you were to google gbp euro you'd probably see it come up at 117 euro, you'd 50 um at the moment roughly um but of course as a business we need to we need to make our own uh profit on those transactions um which i'm sure are considerably better than what you'd receive when you when you um use your bank so uh again we would we'll save you roughly two three percent on the notional value of that exchange uh, on 250,000 that could be the difference of 
around £5,000 to £10,000. Okay, brilliant. Um, right, one more for you, Toby. Uh, let me find them. Uh, yeah. Can you set up some kind of alert so that I can track the currency rate and be notified of it if it goes above a certain rate? Yes, of course. Um, so with the online app, you can um, set alerts for any currency pair that you'd like. Um, if you wanted to just monitor the market, didn't want to make any moves yet, um, didn't have a need to transfer any funds yet, but just wanted to keep an eye on the market, see if it's moving in the right direction for you, you can absolutely set an alert. Um, you can also have a conversation with your, your currency dealer as well. Um, our service is free of charge. Uh, there's no fees. To, to set up an account. Um, there's no fees to use our consultancy services with our experts. Um, so there's no issues with that. They'll happily have a conversation with you, tell you where the market is, where it's moving, um, and even put alerts for you to give you a call to say, just an FYI, market's moved in your direction if you're looking to purchase any, um, any, any funds at all. Um, but yeah, essentially, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's really good to know. Okay, right, I'm gonna go back to Peter. Um, I just need you to unmute Peter. Sorry, we we're getting a little bit of feedback from your channel, so I muted you <laughs> and it went, there we go, perfect, <laughs> thanks. Um, right, Sarah's saying, um, regarding making gifts to children, we talked about this earlier, is the 15 year um, clause only applicable if one is already French resident at the time the gift was made? In other words, if I made the gift before becoming French resident and died, in less than 15 years of becoming French resident, would my children be tax liable for those gifts? No, is the answer simple. Because um, if the gift is made before you arrive, for example, whilst still in the UK, it's under UK rules at that time when you make the gift. And under UK rules, it's called a potentially exempt transfer. Uh, and by definition in the UK, there's a seven year ruling under potential exempt transfers. But that's made before you move. It's not applied. Anything anything done beforehand is then not applied as anything retrospective when you move to France. So no, it wouldn't be an issue. Okay, that's good to know. Um, right, we've had a couple of questions as well. I think quite a few people are a bit confused between being a French citizen versus being a French resident. And the question seems to be. Are the tax rules the same for French citizens as those resident for tax, but not citizens? Well, in simple terms, they're exactly the same. Um, for, you know, your tax liability on moving from whatever country it is in the world to become resident for tax purposes in France is identical to those who are already French citizens. So they are treated in exactly the same way. So their liabilities are exactly the same way for their pensions, for their investments, and exactly the same way you would be by becoming resident. Okay, that makes sense. Great. Um, and one more for you, Peter, and then we're going to have to wrap up, actually, because we are at time. Okay, Mark says, um, my wife and I will be moving... Oh, wait, hold on. So that, that wasn't the one I wanted to ask, sorry. Um, Lynn was saying, I'm a UK national and French resident. My spouse is a German national and UK resident. We jointly own a house in the UK and a house in France with no mortgage. What capital gains would be payable if we were to sell the French house? It's quite an, in quite a complex one. <laughs> yeah, in, 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 well, it is quite complex because the French house is owned by whom? Can you repeat? Um, it seems like... Well, it says we jointly own a house in the UK and a house in France. So it yeah. seems that both houses are in yeah, both. So by definition, yeah, yeah, but, but by definition, half of the house is owned by each of you. And effectively, the portion, if you were to sell either house, in that sense of the word, would be subject to capital gain tax on half of the value on each, because that is a secondary residence to one of you. So that portion that's not your main principal residence is subject to capital gains tax. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, thank you for that, Peter. Right, we're going to wrap it up. I know we're one minute over time, um, but close enough. <laughs> right.
Thank you so much to all of you who attended and thank you one more time to our panel for giving up their time and answering all your questions today. Um, if we didn't get around to your questions, we will make sure that we forward them on to the relevant panelists. And if you do have any additional questions or if you want to get in touch with any of today's panelists, you can also email us at webinar at frenchentree.com. Uh, if you enjoyed today's webinar, keep an eye out for more French Entree webinars over the coming months. We have webinars in the works looking at buying in France for Americans, the cost of buying in France, and more from our Moving to France series. And do make sure you subscribe to our French Entree YouTube channel so you can also enjoy our weekly expert Q&A videos and watch all of these webinars back. Uh, finally, do let us know what you thought of today's webinar. Did you enjoy it? What topics would you like to, uh, to see us cover in upcoming webinars? You can drop us an email at webinar at frenchentree.com. Thank you once again to everyone for attending and thank you one more time to our panel and I'll hopefully see you all on our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.